Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is Gustav Grassel. He is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and a research fellow at the European Resilience Initiative Center. Welcome, Gustav. Thanks for having me. You have just come back from Ukraine, where you have spent a lot of time traveling uh, not only to Lviv or Kiev, but also to Dnipro, one of the hubs uh, in the east of Ukraine, pretty close to the front line. What are the impressions uh, from your trip? You have been to Dnipro on the same day when Dnipro was attacked by Russian missiles. How do Ukrainians perceive these attacks? Well, especially for for the cities in the east, uh, unfortunately, these attacks are kind of their daily business. So our uh, train stopped outside of the train station because, of course, they shot at, at Dnipro, uh, the Dnipro railway station, and then we proceeded from there uh, with a car. Um, there is air alert usually twice a day. Um, people then immediately look in. On Telegram, what's coming? Is it coming fast or is it something that um, might play out or later day? If it's coming fast, they're going to the shelter. Otherwise, it's kind of normal procedure. They're quite resilient. But of course, uh, the problem is uh, Ukraine is is short on on air defense missiles. That was in the news already. Um, And uh, especially by late March, beginning of April, uh, the Russians managed to hit a lot of power stations across Ukraine, hydropower, but also uh, coal thermal plants. Uh, and that, of course, has very bad uh, consequences for the Ukrainian economy, for the defense economy. Uh, but uh, for the next winter, it's also very challenging for Ukraine to uh, install a spare capacity in, in, in power generation. Uh, it will depend on, on how much air defense they will get, whether a lot of cities in Ukraine or can be judged habitable or not. Uh, and that is, of course, a, a dire thing. Yeah, otherwise, um, I mean, on a general mood of Ukrainians, um, I would say in autumn when I was there last time, uh, people were exhausted. Now they're angry. Or they see, I mean, we, I was there before the supplement passed. Um, so they see, they saw all these discussions in Congress and scratched their head and like, what's, what the hell is going on here? They of course saw the uh, preceding weekend that uh, um, Iranian drones are shot down over Israel and nobody cared for nuclear escalation, but the same drones flying into Ukraine um, can't be touched even if they just fall down literally next to NATO borders in uh, Ukrainian uh, Danube ports, uh, close to Romania or in Poland. Uh, and that, of course, is, is leading to a lot of bitterness amongst Ukrainians. They see all the promises not fulfilled. And this, this was not only the supplement. There's uh, EU ammunition initiative being laid. Um, the Czech ammunition initiative, um, uh, got, didn't get the support it needed to source all the 800,000 shells. Um, at the same time, Ukrainians suffer extreme casualties because of the shortage of artillery ammunition, because of the shortage of air defense missiles. Um, um, I talk to people who, who go to these reconstruction conferences and say, look, we can't listen to pledges for reconstruction anymore because the damage done by missile attack just outlasts everything that is pledged by reconstruction conferences at the same time that the same missiles that would help us defending our airspace against the threat would cost a fraction of what has been pledged for reconstruction efforts. Um, so of course, yeah, they go and they play along, but um, there is an anger that there is no real Western strategy. There is, um, yeah, that you, the war is a sideshow for, for a lot of Europeans. Um, while they're putting their life on the line. Um, and that is causing bitterness. Indeed. I have heard it also from many Ukrainians who say, look, uh, what is the reason for uh, promising us uh, hundreds of millions of dollars or euro for the reconstruction when we could just preserve what we have now? And uh, that is absolutely not understandable from the Ukrainian perspective. And actually, from any sane perspective, why don't we stop these Russian attacks by either shooting down missiles or letting Ukrainians shoot the launching pads um, in 
occupied territories or even in Russia. But um, what are the um, what are your impressions from the situation? Like several months long, Ukraine lived in the situation of hunger, no ammunition, no anti-air missiles, continuous Russian attacks. What impact did it have uh, for the front line? Well, for the front line, uh, the current situation still is, and uh, the past situation was extremely difficult. Um, everybody talks about the drone war and that drones play a pivotal role in conserving artillery ammunition. And yeah, that's true. And Ukraine is much more conservative in its use of artillery ammunition compared to the Russians. Still, uh, one capability doesn't replace the other. Uh, so, for example, artillery shells are much more lethal. Uh, drones take equipment out of action. They stop armored fighting vehicles on the Russian side. But if you really want to destroy them, if you really want to make sure that that thing will never be repaired and will never come back again, uh, you call it an artillery fire. Of course, if you lack artillery ammunition, you can't do that. The second thing is, um, the Russian artillery them, so, uh, itself uh, usually is positioned further back where you can't reach them uh, with uh, FPV drones that easy uh, because they're very potent Russian electronic warfare jammers that basically cut off all the signals uh, back and forth. Uh, so the usual procedure is to, uh, to fire counter battery fire. That's basically you have a radar that meters where the shells are flying from and uh, you calculate uh, where the firing position of the gun uh, must have been and then you fire back with artillery. That's, that can be done irrespective of how much communication you get through and what's the electronic warfare situation. But the problem is if you, if you like the shells, you can't do that on a regular basis. And uh, you could actually see that on satellite images that uh, the Russian artillery, especially the tower artillery, those you, you know you have to put behind a truck to tow it around the battlefield. Um, usually they are removed from positions, put into firing positions, uh, they execute a fire mission and off they go. In the last couple of months, the Russians were comfortable enough leaving the guns in their firing position, uh, just shoveling ammunition in and fire because they were used to, well, the Ukrainians don't have the ammunition for counter-battery fire. And that, of course, increases the time a, a Russian gun can spend in hammering Ukrainian positions because they can do so unmolested, which in turn not only doesn't destroy Russian artillery, Russian artillery just destroys a lot of Ukrainian positions and fortifications because they are able to shoot longer uh, and more intensively. Um, so, so this lacking artillery capability it had to sort of follow on or cascading effects on the on the front line that that were detrimental to to the position to, uh, to Ukraine's position, and that really really hurts. That reminds of uh, the situation in early 2020 when uh, the Russians outnumbered uh, the Ukrainians in the uh, case of artillery uh, shots, artillery shells, uh, up to 10 to 1. And some uh, experts say now that the ratio is more or less the same now after the Ukrainians managed to reach some sort of parity in early uh, summer 23 now ukrainians have once again the situation one ukrainian shell to to uh, to, to 10 russian shells but in addition to that russians also use gliding bombs which they throw from uh, their jets which also can uh, operate um, along the front line yeah. without uh, posing to greater risk as far as we see yes so glide bombs are the second big problem um, Ukrainians face. Uh, the problem with glide bombs is they're much more lethal than artillery fire. So uh, they penetrate deeper into earth than a normal artillery shell and when they explode, of course, they're much bigger. They're either 250 kilos or 500 kilos. There are there's some really heavy hitters, even up to four tons, but they're ba barely used. Uh, the usual stuff is 250 or 500 kilos. That, that's most used. Now, uh, talking about the quantity, so uh, if we if we scroll back to last year's counteroffensive, uh, the Russians used glide bombs to to uh, stop the Ukrainian counteroffensive or to help stopping it, of course, in combination with helicopters, mines, all the stuff. But back then, uh, 
They used 20, roughly 20 glide bombs a day, and Ukrainian already flagged, look guys, that's a problem. We really need fighter jets to push away the Russian Air Force because these 20 glide bombs a day are really doing damage. Now, now they shoot 100 to 150 glide bombs a day. So roughly imagine what kind of problem that is now, and especially on the defensive. So with artillery, you can hammer position, you can suppress infantry that's dug in, but uh, the shelters built to survive an artillery barrage, uh, those are completely cratered if you use a glide bomb. Um, the use of glide bombs to, to soften uh, Ukrainian positions and then push through, it can be compared to the railway guns used in World War I and the description of soldiers sitting in the trenches uh, starting to see the fire of these railway guns where basically you're, uh, not only your position is suppressed and you have to go to the bunker, but basically everything, the trench, the bunker, everything is erased in just one shot and you see the splashes coming in and you just can pray because there's nothing you can do, nothing you can prepare for. If this thing comes down on you, uh, you're wiped out immediately. Uh, and that's also a thing for morale. Um, you can basically cope with all other things coming towards you, but you have, you have, as an infantry on the battlefield, zero chance against these guys. Uh, and, and that is, that is really something that nags Ukrainians. And again, they flagged the need for fighter jets a long, long time ago. Um, Ukraine would roughly need 80 fighter jets to cope with all their defensive counter air missions that's from shooting down drones, shooting down cruise missiles to it pushing, sort of putting a constant threat up uh, for the Russian uh, fighter bombers um, to not come too close to the front line. And we're, in terms of Soviet platforms, serviceable Soviet platforms, we are way short of that. And um, this year, only uh, a handful of F-16s will come. And that is that is something we're really um, the West has not done a great job supporting Ukraine because it's a critical capability uh, that Ukraine needs to maintain the critical capability and it's still it's still insufficiently discussed in the West. And then when it, I, I really get angry when I hear that arguments like, yeah, but if 16s won't be a game changer. No, they won't be a game changer in terms of they will propel Ukrainians up to Moscow. But not having F-16 will be a game changer for the Russians. Um, and that's the thing. Uh, a lot of people, when they when they talk about uh, supplying Ukraine with weapons, they they only have the qualitative edge of Western stuff over Ukrainian stuff in mind. And I'm I'm really sorry, but the qualitative edge sometimes isn't that big, or often isn't that big as as a usual computer gamer might imagine. The real trick of Western weapon system is the supply the the reliable. Uh, supply of ammunition for the platform. The same with F-16. I mean, used F-16 AB versions are better than a MiG-29 on the margins. Not in, not big on the margins. But the good thing is you get air-to-air -air missiles for that thing. They're produced in the West. They're stored in the West. Um, can you point me to the large storage site that will supply Soviet-type fighters for another two years of war? Well, let's talk about main battle tanks. So much ink has been spilled about how how much cooler an Abrahams or a a Leopard is compared to a T sixty two. Well, yeah, it's better, but the best thing about Western tanks is you get ammunition for them. Uh, there is not much ammunition production for the Soviet caliber of one hundred twenty five millimeters. Uh, roughly ten percent of all the ammunition supply Ukraine gets is for Soviet type calibers that both ammunition for artillery and ammunition for tanks on fighting vehicles. Um, so and that is that that is the main reason for Ukrainians to say we would like to have more Western weapon systems because it's easier to sustain them in combat. A tank without ammunition is pretty worthless. Uh, armor. You can use it as an armor transport, but um, it, it kind of defeats the point. Uh, and and all these things are, are not kept in mind when, when people in the West talk about what they gave or want to give to Ukraine. 
Absolutely. And uh, that is what reminds me on the early months of this full scale invasion, when uh, there were a lot of voices uh, in the West who said, oh, you cannot use the fighter jets uh, to shoot down the cruise missiles. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources. Well, when Iran launched uh, its attacks with drones and missiles against uh, Israel, the majority, the larger part of drones have been shot down by F-16s. And yeah. suddenly, it's not such a stupid idea to use fighter jets uh, to counter uh, the flying flying unmanned vehicles. Uh, it's suddenly a, be- a good idea. Yeah. And as we know, uh, Ukraine is out of interceptor missiles now. And the jets would be a great supplement and help Ukrainians to prevent strikes on their power plants where each hit by Russian missile costs hundreds of millions of dollar damage. I don't speak about the indirect damage to morale or to economy in in Ukraine. But you have mentioned a very interesting aspect of a lacking of understanding in the West what kind of change the weapons mean for Ukraine. And uh, everything what is less than a wonder weapon uh, which wins the war is being seen as something which we should not send. But the weapons have also a moral boosting uh, quality. And we know that uh, Ukrainian units, they want to have these weapons not only because they can help them to, to defeat the Russians, but because of they have a complex effect. Uh, what are they? Well, what, what, I'll, what I'll tell now, of course, will, will sound utterly strange to a lot of Westerners who uh, think of their armies as the kind of centrally bureaucratic, structured uh, entities. Uh, Ukrainian's army is also much more decentralized than, than all of our armies. Uh, that, that's a legacy of the Donbass war. You have volunteers, you have volunteer donations uh, to the armed forces. Usually they start with the families of the soldiers that have signed up. Um, they want their kids to, to have the best protection possible. Uh, to have the pos- best technology possible. And if you can help as a private individual, you do that. In the Donbass war, this was about helmets, armored vests, weatherproof clothing, etc. Well, Ukrainian army has that by now, but it still goes on, especially about drones, but also electronic warfare systems, um, secure communication, data communication. It's actually quite mind-bogging what sort of types of stuff uh Ukrainian brigades procure by themselves. Um, a lot of brigades that have their own recruitment offices, they have their own training facilities where, where veterans train new rookies so that they don't go through the uh, normal training procedures of the army, which the centralized ones, which are not charged very effective. But the brigades do that themselves. Like If you volunteer for our brigade, we'll train you to the best standards of this war. Also, if you join the brigade, you know, um, the known brigades that attract a lot of financial donations, they have their own research and development offices, so offices whose specific task is to cooperate with defense industry to develop stuff they need from loitering munitions, drones, FPV drones, secure communication, combat management systems, uh, combat information systems, um, jammers. Uh, it's crazy what, what, what stuff is experimented with and done with on a brigade level where, you know, you don't have the formal involvement of Ministry of Defense, the Ministry for Strategic Industries. This is done by companies, by foundations, by civil society donations in cooperation with officers on the ground. That is highly innovative on the positive side. Um, but of course it has a trick. Uh, those brigades who are really known, um, they are able to create much more funding and volunteers than those who, who, uh, are lesser known. And in those who are known, Western equipment is, is often the thing that makes them known. First of all, you are in the press because there's international interest. But second, Western equipment, uh, is the thing that makes you that is much more survivable than Soviet stuff. So if you ponder about either being drafted into the army or volunteering 
Um, and if you if you are sort of in the group that will be drafted, you might think, well, if I volunteer for a brigade that has Western stuff, well, I will survive. I'll just sign up before being drafted to anywhere else. Um, that is driving a lot of funding and people into the brigades that have Western equipment. Um, the, the kind of the promise, uh, if you're sitting in a Bradley, you will survive the battle. If you're sitting in a BMP, bad luck for you. Um, that is really an issue. So, of course, all brigades want to have Western equipment. Uh, not so much for the Western equipment being the super duper weapon system that makes them unilaterally beat up the Russians in a single day. No, because the fallout or the, the, the sort of the cascading effects of having this equipment in terms of volunteers' attention, donations, um, abilities to procure stuff on your own are just so much greater. So of course you want that. Sometimes the Western, the quality of Western equipment is absolutely not what, what we would expect in the West. For example, take the Leopard 1. Um, I was much ridiculing you. How can you give Ukraine such an old tank? It's, um, it has a smaller gun than all the other tanks, um, a less capable gun in terms of penetration and annihilating other armor. Um, it is weaker armored. So why do you do that? Uh, actually, Ukrainians like the Leopard 1. First of all, the gun is accurate. It shoots further than the Russian tanks and uh, it hits. The second thing, the optics are good. Uh, you see a lot. Uh, the third thing is you have a lot of room inside. Uh, now I come to the self-made improvisation. What do you use it for? You can equip, you can make so if you can insert batteries, you can insert signal equipment, you can insert displays of, to display uh, drone footage, uh, to display other combat information stuff. So you can upgrade this thing. The other thing is very light. So in muddy ground, it doesn't sink in. Um, it is a Cold War equipment. It is meant to, to be maintained by conscripts in the then Bundeswehr, which had, it was a conscript army. So, of course, the Ukraine is looking at this, oh, this is all purely mechanic. Um, you kind of get an idea what it is about, even if you're not formally trained. Uh, the repair rate of these things are, are, are pretty good. So they're actually quite happy with it. And why do they need the upgrades in terms of displays? Well, just to give you a picture of how armored vehicles are, are, are used in the war. So the front line itself uh, is, is an absolute zone of death. Uh, the, there are so many drones buzzing around. Artillery comes in so fast. Within a minute of your appearance, you will have artillery fire on your hat. You cannot stay in a, in, in a, not only on the front line, but also several kilometers behind that. You have a maximum time of survival with any vehicle that is about 15 to 20 minutes. If you are longer in there, you will be killed by loitering munitions or FPV drones. And if you stay in a firing position for a bit longer, uh, artillery will get you. So how are tanks or infantry fighting vehicle used? They're tasked with a specific mission, either fire at, or uh, for example, infantry fighting vehicles, they're often used to evacuate casualties, also to bring supplies to forward exposed positions, because it's your only chance to evacuate casualties with, in these kind of robust vehicles. But you dash in, execute your mission, dash out. So why now displays are a cool thing for, for a very old tank? Because then he can see what the drone is seeing, so he can hide himself, can fastly maneuver in where his firing mission is because he already had seen the constant monitoring of the enemy on the drone footage. The tank commander exactly knows what to fire about, how to orient himself. He doesn't have to spend a lot of time exposing himself, getting, getting himself oriented. What's the situation? What's my mission? What I have to do? Whom I have to fire at? He basically knows that in advance because he has a computer that displays what he needs to do. He can very effectively execute that mission which in terms of the good old Leopard 1 is just surprise the Russians, destroy X, Y, Z with a few shots and retreat out of there quickly. And it's light, it's fast, it's accurate, it does that. So, uh, yeah, but it's a Western tank. Um, so, so 
I think a lot of people in the West have have a computer game impression, you know, world on tanks, tank on tank, I need to destroy a T-90M at 5,000 meters. And if I can't do that, the thing is crap. Well, you don't have to. Um, most of your firing missions will be destroy something else. Um, said of that, but yeah, tanks have been much less important in this war than, uh, than in previous wars. Uh, but on the other hand, they might actually become more important in the, in the coming month. Uh, because the Russians are increasingly developing tanks which are well protected against drones. They have uh, cage armor, they have uh, these kind of turtle tanks where you have sort of metal, sheet metal that is that is impeding the tank's conventional ability to perform as, as, a, as a main battle tank, but makes them very good and safe transport, means of transport for infantry. They have big jammers on the top. Um, and then, of course, you call in another tank and say, look, race in, destroy that, race out. And uh, that is what we observe now is the development of absolutely new uh, ways of use even old equipment and, in addition, usage of the new equipment and usage of equipment which is off the shell, uh, commercial drones, Mavic, Auto, others, and the self-made drones like Kamikaze FPV drones which a lot of Ukrainian companies produce. But now the Ukrainians test a very new part of the drones warfare, um, artificial intelligence for the drones to counter Russian electronic warfare. How much of future is in this topic and how much realistic is this AI already now? Well, it's being used on a daily basis. Uh, part of the success uh, defending the front line or at least limiting the damage the Russian did by breaching the lines can be attributed to artificial intelligence piloted FPVs. So the, the front line, this, this zone of death, it's not only a physical zone of death uh, where the destructive power of artillery, of mechanized forces and of course of drones in all iterations is horrendous. Uh, it is all, also an electronic field of death. Uh, around the front line and, and a bit thereafter, uh, you live in a completely GPS denied environment. There is just no chance to, to have proper navigation data using satellite navigations. But it's also a communication inhibited and sometimes a really communication denied environment. So why you just don't even get signals, data or voice, doesn't matter, of any sort through because the, the, the amount of overlay and jamming is so big. So a, a drone can't be piloted completely to the target on its own. Uh, what Ukrainians now can do is uh, give sort of the drone an orientation, what to strike, when they see the target and then the drone drives itself into the target. Um, even with commercial drones, I mean, they lose a lot of, yeah, you said it, DJI Mavics, etc. Also for the strike role, just for the sheer quantity used, they use, uh, commercial available drones, but usually they reprogram that. So they take the physical hardware. This is the drone, but then basically delete the, the controlling software and play on on the, the, the drone, their own developed software solution that is safer in terms of um, uh, denying the Russians the ability to capture their drones, uh, but also then has a lot of applications um, uh, for the drone to orient itself, but also to engage the target independently of uh, the relay, uh, relay to the operator. And of course, then the next level of this is uh, the Drones that can, that basically you program, you need to do that and they can independently execute a mission. You task them, I don't know, I need to interdict uh, armed vehicles along this road and the drones will navigate towards that road without uh, having a contact to the operator. And then of course will this, uh, will be able to, to see a camouflaged hidden armored vehicle, uh, distinguish it from other things found on the battlefield 
uh, like disabled armored vehicles, like rocks, like destroyed houses, uh, and strike on it. Um, then, of course, the next level is to program AFVs to uh, program drones to cooperate with each other to kind of see, okay, I want to have a because of course the Russians are, are ramping up the protection system, so you need multiple drones on one vehicle. Usually, that by now is coordinated by operators with eyesight, but if you don't have the ability to communicate with the drones, they need to know who is the first, who is the second drone, who is the third drone, will we strike simultaneously from multiple directions or will we have consecutive attacks? The drones need to make a damage assessment on the target they strike. They need to know when the target is dead and finished off to redirect themselves, etc. All that is not trivial, um, but on this Ukrainians, they really have innovative industries. And, and here also to stress, the innovation cycle of all that stuff I describe now is so fast. A trick that, that made your drone survive two weeks or one month ago might be completely obsolete by now. Um, this is also why, for example, German or, or other US and British uh, companies go into Ukraine uh, because otherwise it's just impossible to stay on top of the technological development. And the other thing is um, Ukrainians also in, uh, develop interceptor drones, so drones that are specifically designed to intercept Russian drones and, and kill them. Um, and that is also a very interesting thing because, again, if you want to size the initiative in combat, you need to deny the enemy an ability to use certain capabilities and denying the enemy uh, the ability to use drones. If you want to do that with conventional air defense systems, you just spend so much ammunition at so high costs on these things that it's cheaper and more effective to just mass produce interceptor drones that kill the other drones to deny the enemy the ability to use drones and hence see what you're doing. Um, or, or call in artillery or, or strike with loitering munitions. So, so these are, are enormously interesting developments and they are very fast. Um, uh, we're talking about extremely short uh, cycles of innovation. And if I, if I can shout out a big recommendation to the U Europeans, overhaul your regulations on investment into defense matters. There are a lot of funds, banks that have funding available, but they can't invest, for example, in Ukrainian defense industry because uh, it's forbidden. The financial regulation doesn't allow it. Um, I, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I just constantly talk even to German enterprises working on the ground who have to get American or Israeli funding for what they're doing in Ukraine because there's no chance to generate the capital to do so in Europe itself. Now, what happens then is all their research and developmental effort is then owned by other countries. Uh, and the IP rights will go, will go out. This is also a lot of, a lot of Ukrainian highly innovative companies work with foreign capital because they provide the capital uh, to produce stuff, and of course they are interested in the research and development. And Europe is totally for for the, for our rigidity in in our financial regulations. We are we are increasingly cut out of of that game, uh, and that will only hurt us. I mean, this is um, uh, the the developmental effort on artificial intelligence and munition development. That's something that will shape future wars. Um, we, it's like the machine guns of World War One. Um, you suddenly see what's in what, what these systems are capable of, uh, or the aircraft. And in World War One, a lot of aircraft manufacturers, who are now of course well recognized, all long gone, have started as basically shed shops, um, where where a few people tested around the aircraft and just tried to assemble whatever they could. Um, and that's that's. Pretty much how a lot of the Ukrainian drone industry looks like, but I guess some of these enterprises will will then, over the course of the next century, be the kind of yeah, the Boeing's and the <coughs> Curtis Wrights and and the Fokkers and um, will produce one or the other aircraft as well or bigger system. But that is exactly what we have experienced uh, in World War One, which you have mentioned. And first, uh, the aircraft was used as a reconnaissance 
uh, device then to bomb the enemy positions and after that uh, aircraft against aircraft fights yeah. uh, started to happen the interception mission that is what we see with drones first yeah. uh, recon missions then uh, droplets or kamikaze drones yeah. and now you have mentioned drones uh, drones against drones missions yeah. but what is the development on the russian side what is russia's winning strategy for this war regarding military tactics, equipment, and politics? Well, so the Russian theory of victory is that Russia can outbuild the West. Uh, <clears throat> when Zaluzhny wrote his article that the war is in a static phase, <clears throat> I wouldn't say stalemate because it's not a stalemate, but it's a static war. It's not a war for maneuver. Um, he was, of course, absolutely right. Uh, and the Russians conceded that as well. I said, well, but we can live with that. We can produce more tanks and heavy equipment, even though if Ukrainians destroyed a lot of that. But on the road, we will erode Ukrainian defensive forces and we will erode them to the point that it can't offer uh, structured, um, organized military resistance. The Russians are not so much about capturing territory. They're even revising their manuals, how deep a regiment or a division can penetrate each day quite dramatically. Um, because they have, they see that, that the superiority of firepower over movement, at least at the moment, uh, does not allow for big conquests and breakthrough battles, etc. Uh, but if they, if they only take a few hundred meters a day, that's good for them as long as in this few hundred meters. Uh, they can as destroy as much Ukrainian soldiers and equipment as they can. So they try to really apply the maximum of firepower. Now, the problem with the Russian army compared to the Ukrainian army is they're, of course, not as innovative. Most of the new Russian tactics that are now played out, they were tried out by Prigozhin with his Wagner PMCs in, in different iterations and now applied across the force. The, the advantage the Russians have is they can really scale things. Um, as I said in Ukraine, it's highly innovative, but it's individual brigades. And because the army is, has increased X fold and didn't have this kind of big bureaucratic muscle in terms of Ministry of Defense, Defense Academy, yeah, they had it, but you know, this, this is a slim bureaucratic um, support apparatus that now is extremely busy just keeping operations running, just training officers for current needs, just leading all the formations in battle. Uh, Ukrainian ability to, to take innovative practices from one brigade and just quickly apply it and spread it across the all armed forces. That's much more tricky for the Ukrainian side. That's easier for the Russian side because they have huge bureaucratic support. If they see, okay, that is successful, they have a massive industry that can mass produce whatever, and they have a huge bureaucracy that can retrain their forces to whatever procedure works best. Uh, and I thought that the, the innovation cycle is much longer on the Russian side than on the Ukrainian side. The mass application of that new tactics, etc., cetera, um, is the problem. Uh, and I've seen now, so they are basically attacking on foot with tanks in, in and infantry fighting vehicles only in the combat support role. They're just doing a few hundred meters a day. They're very fighting very casualty intensive. They, especially people, they don't give a shit sacrificing them. Um, they, they're very creative inventing reasons to force people signing up for, uh, for storm units, either storm V or storm Z, uh, that are used then as advanced parties for, for this assault. And each assault is, is accompanied by massive firepower, both in glide bombs or air attacks, artillery, and intended just to grind down uh, the Ukrainian army. We also need to keep aware of the size of the Russian army. So um, when Shoigu said that this year they will reach more than 700,000, I think 750 or 15 or 725,000 contract soldiers, uh, then that figure is taken to be taken seriously in some extent that yeah that that is really the case uh, that means 375,000 new soldiers drafted into the Russian army 
this year, or not drafted, uh, volunteered, signed up for the Russian army this year. Um, but that means the Russian army will only increase by 170 or 180,000 soldiers on top because the rest is just compensating casualties. And that's also something to sink in. The Russians are continuing each year, roughly have to replace 200,000 casualties, uh, which is a lot of hard work for the Ukrainians to induce that to their armed forces, but they are able to replace that. And they're manning an army that now in Ukraine is 16 combined arms army and tank army strong. So one tank army and the 15 others are combined armed army. And on top of that, you have uh, several independent air assault and naval infantry uh, divisions. That is a huge quantity. The overall size just of the ground forces in Ukraine uh, will exceed uh, the half million this year. It's a huge force. Um, and yeah, the quality of that force is not on par with what the Ukrainians have. Uh, but the Ukrainians have slightly less than 300,000 men in front on serving on the front line. Rest is real support, securing the border with Belarus, securing the border, uh, with the remaining border with Russia. Um, and, and this, this, Superiority in numbers is what the Russians try to leverage in it just a brutal grinding war of attrition. Uh, I mean that, you know, that's why artillery ammunition matters. That's why HIMARS matters. That's why the French glide bombs, who by the way are awesomely effective, matter. Uh, because firepower on the Ukrainian side again is the only chance to really degrade uh, what's there on the other side. And only if that is degraded to the point the Russians, the Russians can't replenish it, then, and only then, the Russians might think maybe we should exit the war or whatever. Before that, any talk about ceasefire, about negotiation, is just pure illusions because the Russians see that they will outbuild the world. They out-recruit uh, Ukraine. They have a bigger demographic base. They're just throwing more mass. They can perfectly live with the fact that they won't achieve any success in maneuvering around as long as they just induce casualties after casualties on the Ukraine side. And don't forget that uh, the Russian attacks uh, happen on the territory of Ukraine, while the Ukrainian counterattacks also happen on the territory of Ukraine. If we exclude... Uh, a pretty impressive, but still uh, not that large scale attacks of Ukrainian drones against Russian refineries, oil refineries or oil depots or some other high value targets in Russia, the whole war takes place in Ukraine. So Russian economy doesn't suffer from uh, this war. Russian population doesn't suffer from this war. And that is also a part of Russia's strategy to destroy the very basics of the life infrastructure in Kharkiv or in other large cities in Ukraine to induce new refugees uh, waves. And uh, we know that Ukraine uh, is out of population with millions of Ukrainians who have left uh, their country. What is the impact of this war now for the economy and for the society in Ukraine after uh, more than two years of the full-scale war? So. The, of course, there are no clear numbers who, who is still in Ukraine and, and under Ukrainian control or on Ukrainian controlled territories, but the estimations range that are roughly a bit north of 20 million. Uh, and that's basically cutting Ukrainian population in half. The rest either lives under Russian control or is displaced or abroad. Um, and that is, of course, uh, a dire situation for Ukraine. Also, uh, Ukraine uh, needs to constantly balance, for example, drafting uh, new people into the army versus sustaining the economy. And sustaining the economy in a long war is an important thing. Um, current Ukrainian defense budget is 30% uh, salaries, uh, sorry, 70% uh, salaries. Uh, then we have maintenance and operation, and then actually buying new equipment. Um, so, 
so they constantly need to balance uh, how much equipment do we have to buy because that also saves life. Every jammer, every drone saves life. Versus drafting new people into the armed forces, which, of course, you need to replenish losses. On the societal side, I mean, bombing Kharkiv into into a new Aleppo, of course, on the Russian side makes sense because it's a young, creative, tech-heavy city that, of course, has a major contribution to the war effort because these are young, creative, um, well-educated people who produce a lot of neat stuff if you let them produce. Uh, the second thing in the damaging uh, Ukrainian electricity infrastructure. Ukraine is now basically down to the one nuclear power station that is still operational and it controls. Um, uh, and they are working very hard to, to subsidize the stuff that was destroyed or to repair, but it's tricky. Uh, of course, welding, cutting, machining, all you need to, uh, build weapons, uh, takes electricity. Um, it is, it is critical for society to continue to function also from a defense industrial perspective. Uh, and, and here, uh, air defense is, is the thing. Uh, Kiev, for example, is a relatively normal life and you have now much more people living in Kiev and the kind of suburban, uh, a conglomerate around Kiev, uh, because it's, there is air defense. Um, other cities that are less well protected uh, have a much harder time to just provide basic safety for for the citizens. Uh, last but not least, if you, uh, I, I don't know if I've talked about the Orland drones or the Russian reconnaissance drones that because of the lack of frontline air defense systems, so I'm not talking now about Patriots, SMPT and etc., but frontline air defense like Oza, Strela, etc. Uh, have, have a fun time just flying above the sailing of, of gun based air defense systems like Gepard, et cetera, and reconnoitering Ukrainian positions, um, reserves, ammunition depots, et cetera. Uh, they're a huge problem. They're becoming an ever increasing problem for, for the, uh, for the Ukrainian armed forces because they call in uh, the Lancet loitering munitions, but they also become increasing a problem for the civilians living in frontline or close to frontline cities like Dnipro, like Kharkiv, uh, because they, they fly as deep as 70, 80 kilometers into the Ukrainian rear. And if they, if they see a military target, they will call in Lancet. But if they see a civilian target like market, frequent social events, Whatever, everything that brings together a lot of people, uh, they will uh, they will relay that target to the Shahid attacks, um, and that's how they basically find out and evaluate where to strike uh, with these Shahid drones. And these these attacks on residential buildings, etc., they're not accidentally. They try to kill as many Ukrainians as possible, and they send their reconnaissance drones to look after daily lives of the people. And then try to hit what daily life happens for most of that. So also this kind of frontline air defense thing, that's, that's really a thing you can't, of course, for, for a lot of reasons, it's hard, for example, to protect Kharkiv with Patriots because of course, uh, being so close and being within the range of loitering munitions, if you are that close with a big air defense system, you make yourself a target. So you have to be much more mobile. Uh, uh, and, and sort of maneuver in, maneuver out, hide yourself, etc. You can't really have a constant air defense posture like, uh, like it's done more or less around Kiev. Um, it's much more tricky tactically, but still you need something. Uh, you need at least means to make it more difficult for the Russians to really reconnoiter and strike each and every civilian target they find out there. Can the new U.S. aid package, 61 billion U.S. dollar, have a significant impact on the way how this war is being fought? Well, I would say the most significant impact is that it will allow Ukraine to survive the war. Um, if if I can be critic about the Europeans, they have been utterly incapable of sub, uh, substituting the U.S. in in this critical moment. We we have been late in 
supplying artillery shells, we've been, we have been picky about air defense, etc. We, we don't produce our air defense missiles like Iris T and, and SMPT in the scale that the US produces Patriots. So it depends for defense industrial logic, uh, because of that, just it depends on the US. Um, yeah, the package will be big enough to make Ukraine survive. There's fortunately also a lot of budget support for the Ukrainian MOD. Um, they will, I mean, Ukrainian defense industry is roughly running at half capacity in many cases, in many areas. It's of course not evenly, um, sort of the even idling of the defense industry, but some, some branches are more affected than others because when we talk about producing stuff in Ukraine, we usually mean assembly. You need to buy your materials. You need to buy subcomponents abroad. Therefore, you need foreign cur currency. You just can't print rivnas and, and go for it. Uh, you need foreign currency. You need to buy that on the international market, and then you can assemble it in Ukraine and field it. And this will allow uh, uh, Ukrainian armed forces to be much more generous in terms of electronic warfare protection, also drone protection. Uh, with armed forces, that's that's a huge help. Um, as far as I saw, also armed fighting vehicles will be on the list, and that's also a big plus because the Bradley infantry fighting vehicle is is just such a neat thing. Uh, it's com universal. You can use it for pretty much everything. It can engage every target on the battlefield, uh, even up to other main battle tanks, um, and and it's and it's reliable. Um, so, so it's, it's kind of the king of the systems, uh, uh, and Ukrainians really long for them. And basically, they're the only source of infantry fighting vehicles we have there. There are 45 martyrs being repaired for Ukraine right now. I think 20 uh, Rheinmetall already said they will deliver now or are already delivering. Uh, but there are much, uh, mo there's a much more limited base of martyrs available for, for Ukraine anyway, because the German stocks are not so big. American stocks that they still have some Bradleys, uh, and it's an awesome system. Uh, so, so this is a big relief. M113, um, the armor personal carrier, it's also a great thing. It's, it's like, it's like the Leopard 1, uh, in terms of main battle tanks. It's just simple. It's easy, um, to maintain. It works reliably drives. Yes, it's not the most cutting edge technology geeky thing, but it works all the time. Uh, it's really hard to kill. Uh, and that's an advantage in itself, uh, being there, being reliable. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, there is one thing where I really don't get Washington, and that is the issue of fighters. Um, I mean, there's a European fighter coalition on F-16s. Uh, that is, that is progressing very slowly. Um, the big issue in Ukraine is not like the press reported training the pilots. The big issue is the logistical support and creating the logistical infrastructure in Ukraine to completely service the aircraft for which you need, uh, you need, uh, the U.S. manufacturer and you need also, um, the U.S. much more on, on board of this. Um, I don't know why Washington is so reluctant to really embrace these efforts. Um, I haven't figured out. But as I said in the beginning of the interview, fighters really matter. Uh, and Western fighters really matter because you just don't get uh, ammunition for, for the Eastern type fighters. And yeah, I just hope that, that this will accelerate. Um, Ukraine needs every fighter it gets. Um, and, and I'm, I mean, sometimes I get these arguments, yeah, but you can't give them uh, into a war zone because they're a real critical technology, blah, 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 blah. Like, guys, you have given much more advanced F-16s to Pakistan who took them to maneuvers in China. So, uh, I mean, I'll take almost anything for a reason, but that I'll not take. Because if you have, if you have been in maneuvers in China with, with such a piece of equipment, you can regard it as compromised. Regardless of what Ukrainians will get or not get, you can regard it as compromised. Indeed. And that is, of course, uh, the message for the world. We need to support Ukraine, not with uh, one huge package. 
uh, which has been uh, in uh, on on its way now, but also create a sustainable day by day, month by month supply chain. Provide Ukraine with on every single day more equipment than Russia produces because it's yeah. as you said, it's a war of attrition, and we need to create an advantage for Ukraine not only today or not only on a certain front. It can be of Divka or Robotina or Chisovyar that uh, create Ukraine with uh, to to provide Ukraine with a significant support in every day, every piece of front line day by day until the victory. Thank you so much. It was Gustav Gressel, who is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm happy to say it, a research fellow at the European Resilience Initiative Center. Welcome on board, Gustav. Welcome back to Germany after your Ukraine trip. And uh, thank you for this very insightful interview. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I hope to do more military nerd stuff in the future. And it's amazing. It's what we all uh, want to do and what is needed right now, because this war is not the end. The world is more unstable and more dangerous uh, than it used to be during the last decades. And a lot of resilience is needed in the West and in the democratic world. Thank you so much. And don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel and wait for the next stunning interviews. Thanks a lot.